We're here with Wharton Finance Professor Eric Gillia to talk about one of his research papers, which actually found the link between voter preferences and the shale boom. That's really quite timely at this time when the election seems to be very raucous and very interesting. So welcome, Professor. Thank you for having me. So tell us about your paper. So basically what we try to do is to try to, we try to trace out how political change occurs in uh, the U.S. electoral system. And so the basic idea here is there are kind of two sets of hypotheses. One is that when voter preferences shift, your elected officials change their positions to adapt to the new preferences. The other is when voter preferences shift, they throw out their old elected representative and bring in somebody new. And so we kind of test each of these two hypotheses within the context of shale discoveries. So shale discoveries are an interesting place to look at this because when these discoveries occur, uh, there's a large change in voter preferences uh, to become more conservative and supportive of uh, issues that uh, will help underpin the development of shale. And so what we see overall is that there's a shift in voting for more conservative political candidates, Republican candidates, and that linked with this, rather than existing Democratic candidates changing their views to adapt, uh, that in fact they, uh, they lose their jobs and Republican candidates replace them. And so in terms of which of these two hypotheses seem to dominate, it's the case that uh, you basically find a new representative that fits your preferences as opposed to your, pre your ele elected rep representative adapting their prefer preference uh, uh, towards your views, which is kind of interesting when we typically think of politicians as kind of saying whatever they need to say uh, to get elected. This evidence would suggest otherwise. So you actually gather data from seven states. I understand mm -hmm. those are red states. Uh, some of them are red. Some of them are, I guess, purple. Uh, you have Pennsylvania, West Virginia, uh, North Dakota, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, uh, Texas. And many of these states actually were maybe not always considered red states, certainly prior to uh, shale discoveries. So what are some key takeaways from your paper? Yeah. So I think the key takeaways are this, that in essence you see that, uh, that the, the mechanism through which the political change occurs is through bringing in new representatives. Uh, and that, that we find several other effects in that when you bring in a new representative, uh, you get a lot of other things with that, not just people that help pr uh, protect shale, but also people that may vote differently on social issues or other issues that are unrelated uh, to shale. And then lastly, we kind of have a final uh, result in the paper where we show that even the, the Democrats that had uh, adjusted their voting record slightly to become more conservative, uh, still lost their jobs, suggesting that maybe they couldn't kind of credibly convey that they had adapted to the new preferences of their congressional districts. I think what really grabbed me about your paper was your major aha finding, which was, you know, when there's a major big economic, positive economic shock to an area mm -hmm. that actually uh, more Democrats become Republicans. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me why that is? Yeah. And so this is one interesting aspect of the analysis where we, we're actually able to obtain access to exit poll data. And so some people might say, well, this result was driven by the change, changes in the electoral makeup, people moving into the area. But in fact, through this exit poll data, people are asked about their prior political preferences. Uh, and, and we actually show that people that tended to be you know, self-identify as historically being more liberal shift to become more conservative when these shell discoveries occur. And it's not uh, maybe surprising when you think about uh, the positions that each of these political parties uh, ha have tended to have on energy development and shale that you have in these areas large increases in income, large increases in uh, job growth, and that basically, uh, you know, people in these areas uh, adapt their preferences to try to protect uh, uh, and ensure that this development uh, continues. Uh, and, you know, that historically the Republican Party has you know, been more consistent with doing that with energy development. So I have to ask this question, and that mm -hmm. is, so can you think you can handicap the race for us this election year? Well, I think what the results suggest is not necessarily that, um, that uh, you know, let's say one presidential candidate versus another, because our results are really at the 
congressional district level, but they suggest that the, the magnitude of the shift that's occurred, that has occurred that's linked to shale discoveries are quite large. And so in our paper, we talk about that in aggregate since the beginning of the shale boom, 17 Democratic seats have switched to Republican. And that, that is, uh, in terms of kind of economic magnitudes, that's half of the current Republican majority in Congress. So to me, what it suggests is that if the Democratic Party does not kind of adapt its views or seek out these energy voters in a way that they haven't been before, that particularly gaining control of the U.S. House of Representatives uh, will be challenging for them uh, because, you know, there's a large, uh, as large component of the majority uh, that the Republicans have that exists due to their uh, preference uh, and support of shale development. And so uh, until that part of the Democratic platform maybe changes or adapts to that uh, aspect of the electoral calculus, I think it will be challenging on at least the House side uh, for Democrats to make significant headway. Did that come as a surprise to you? The magnitude certainly came as a surprise. I think, I think we expected to see you know, some shift towards uh, Republicans, but when you actually trace out the effect on House seats, compare that to the current majority in Congress, uh, what, ends, what, you, what you end up seeing is that this was quite important for the shift in the U.S. House that we've seen over the last 15 years. And, uh, and this is linked with both U, uh, shale oil and shale gas development. Essentially, when we plot this out, we see one shift that occurs when shale gas development happens in the mid-2000s, and then, and, then, and then another one that occurs uh, later on in 2010, 2011, 2012, when uh, shale oil development really uh, gets going. Were there other things findings that surprised you? I think the, uh, the, 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 the last finding that I mentioned that, that uh, even those representatives that try to adapt uh, in altering their voting records more, to be more conservative, and so for this we look at uh, different uh, interest group scoring of congressmen, uh, and we, we find is even those that adapt just a little, you know, adapt a little bit, uh, are not able to maintain their uh, their seats. And so, uh, to me, that suggests that kind of more uh, significant, uh, more significant steps would need to be taken to kind of demonstrate that uh, they've adapted to their new voter preferences. So, what are some practical implications of your findings? Yeah, I mean, I would say in practice, what it, it documents a few things. First, it shows that um, there are a lot of spillover effects into other policy areas when one policy area changes. So shift in energy preferences by voters uh, leads to shifts in other areas, social issues, tax issues uh, that maybe, you know, you may not have expected. Uh, and I, I would say that's probably one of the kind of most interesting practical aspects of, uh, of it. So what sets your research apart from prior work in this area? Yeah, I would say um, prior work by and large uh, has not focused on these spillover effects. So they've looked at whether a change in voter preferences can be observed, you can observe something in the data to see uh, whether people actually change their votes one way or another. We're showing that because of the electoral system that we have, that having an elected representative, you kind of, uh, you know, they have their views, and if you you basically kind of rank uh, how important your views are, and you may end up getting some things in there with that electoral representative that you may not have anticipated. And then the other aspect, which is new, is to show that even those who uh, do shift more to the right, uh, it doesn't seem to matter for voters that much. Uh, and so it's either a question of credibility, they can't credibly shift, uh, or a question of uh, the, the nature of the party structure that even if they do shift, the rest of the party, which is going to manage uh, you know, uh, bills and the seniority system and uh, committees may not be conducive to advancing the voter preferences that have now uh, changed in these districts. How are you going to follow up your research? Well, there are a couple of different avenues we're exploring. So one avenue would be to look at uh, uh, what are the sorts of people that seem more apt to shift their preferences. Are there 
particular characteristics or demographics there. Another is to look at um, how this uh, political change spills over and affects firms. And so uh, you might imagine that firms are working to build political relationships, to get favors of some sort or uh, preferences of some sort uh, in different uh, aspects of government, whether it's regulation or laws. Uh, and now you have a shift that's occurred because of these, uh, the energy issue. And so you might uh, expect that some firms are now going to be more out of favor because they were connected to politicians that lost their seats. Some other firms may be more in favor because now they've, they're connected to politicians that are in power. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.